Good afternoon. My name is Noah Hillman, and I'm a neonatologist at Cardinal Dent Lennon Children's Hospital in St. Louis University. Today, it's my pleasure to talk about some of the recent advances in surfactant therapies. Some of these you may be using in your uh, NICU already or have been discussing as possible uh, interventions. Uh, and some of these are still under investigation. You'll see me in and the recording, I left a little picture in the corner, but I may disappear at times so you can see my slides. I don't have any financial disclosures to, to tell you about. Chiesa Pharmaceutical, which does make CuraSurf, um, does give us some extra money for some of our preterm lamb experiments, but they're not involved in the conduction of the experiments or in the analysis of the results. I will talk about some off-label uses of both delivering surfactant and off-label uses of a combination of bedesonide and surfactant throughout this talk. So after the end of this talk, the viewer should be able to discuss the transition of the lungs and airways at birth and the role of the glottis in this transition, discuss the indication for CPAP failure and the need for surfactant, Uh, LMA, which is a laryngo mask airway, or through a less invasive surfactant technique, or LISA. LISA is also referred to as minimally invasive surfactant techniques, and so MIST therapy is also in uh, the literature. So as you uh, watch this lecture or read uh, manuscripts, uh, LISA and MIST are similar. We'll discuss some of the advances that are going on with surfactant a therapy with regard to nebulization and some of the research that supports this use and uh, further areas of research that are needed. And we'll finish with a discussion of the combination of bedesonide and surfactant for decreasing lung injury and disease. This is a contrast x-ray uh, image of a rabbit starting to breathe at birth. As you can see, as the rabbit takes more and more breaths, more of the airways begin to appear. They begin with the larger airways, and then slowly, as you can see now, the alveolar begin to open. This is a similar transition that happens in our newborn babies when they're born. We take giant breaths at birth, and we drive the fluid into the interstitium of our lungs. That fluid in the interstitium of our lungs is slowly absorbed over the next about six hours through the lymphatics and through the venous system, but about 10% of babies need assistance with this transition, and CPAP can be very useful in uh, assisting with it. The reason CPAP is useful is that in these uh, example of uh, preterm surfactant deficient rabbits, what you can see is, although we can give giant breaths to these surfactant deficient rabbits, um, when we take away the breath and during exhalation, they, their lung gas volume falls almost back down to normal and to zero. Whereas in the lambs and in the rabbits that get uh, PEEP, what we can do is over time, those rabbits are able to develop an FRC. So are able to recruit up their lung and maintain their lung. But without the PEEP, uh, they lose this part of the air. Graphically, it, it looks very similar to this. So in these preterm rabbits that are sufficient uh, surfactant deficient, what you see is that in a lung where there's no surfactant or PEEP, you have nearly complete collapse of the airways at the end of expiration. If we add a little bit of surfactant, you can see there's more air within the airways. If we add PEEP of three, you can see the airways of these uh, preterm rabbits are well more well expanded. And in the surfactant and PEEP animals, it's the most expanded. I want to show you some patterns now using a similar technique. These are generated by Stuart Hooper's group in um, Australia, utilizing a similar techniques for, for rabbits. But the interest is in this group is to look at the glottic closure, so the top part of our airway. So to orient you, the lungs of these rabbits will be at the bottom. Um, you'll have a very long trachea, and then the glottis, or the area where your vocal cords are, will be in this area of blue. So in the majority of preterm babies, the glottis remains open for the majority of breath. 
So as you can see in this purple area, that um, there's opening and closing of the area around the vocal cords. And you can see that air is moving in and out of the lungs of this preterm rabbit. Unfortunately, in some apneic preterm infants, the glottis remains closed in that the infant uh, has this irregular breathing pattern and they actually revert to the fetal condition of a closed glottis. So in this video, what you see is that there, the glottis is closed and although the rabbit is trying to take an occasional breath, there is no air getting down to the lower portions of the airways. If you have a situation where your glottis is closed and you're giving positive pressure breaths, you can see that there is some air in the airways. But now that the glottis is closed, so the area within my um, circle is not opening and closing, even when they're giving positive pressure breaths, we're not moving air through there. So what we've learned over time from these type of videos and from our own experiences in the delivery room is that sometimes you get a baby that ends up, um, was breathing and then goes apneic. And even though you're trying to bag it with your uh, positive pressure ventilation, you're unable to move the chest. And we all know the story of those situations where we then innovate the baby and they start uh, and they're able to move the chest fine. Or we actually go to innovate the baby, we stimulate them, they open their glottis back up and they start breathing okay again on our, on our CPAP device. We do know from uh, studies that continuous positive airway pressure can stabilize this breathing pattern and increase the time that the glottis is open. So basically the use in those babies that are trying to breathe, early use of CPAP in the delivery room helps stabilize that glottis, lets it keep opening and prevents it from falling back into that apneic state. In that apneic state, um, you cannot get uh, airway through. In their studies of, of rabbit pups, we do find that if you have a high enough pressure, so that's about seven centimeters of pressure in their studies, which is likely about 10 centimeters of pressure, you could cause an increase in apnea. And that's why we, in the delivery room, use somewhere between five and eight centimeters of uh, pressure while trying to stabilize these newborn uh, babies in that we can help utilize CPAP, as you've heard earlier, to try to help these babies both transition by clearing out that fluid out of their lungs and opening their airways up, but also with maintaining this glottis. You've heard a little bit about CPAP earlier today, and this is a, a diagram from a study we did uh, multiple years ago in sheep. And what it shows is that if you have a certain amount of surfactant, you can be maintained on CPAP. In these lambs, what you can see is that if you have over four milligrams per kilogram of surfactant, you do well on CPAP. If you have less, you fail. Whereas in a human, we wouldn't allow their CO2s to get to 200. In these lamb experiments, what you see is that if you have 4% of the normal endogenous pool size, so 100 milligrams per kilogram is the normal amount a, ter a term baby has at birth, you can be maintained on CPAP. And that's why CPAP can be tried on many of our small babies, especially if they've gotten antenatal steroids. This is data that is similar to what has probably been presented earlier today. And this is out of Rich Poland's group. And what it shows is that in babies under 1,250 grams, 88% of them were placed on nasal CPAP. So 12% weren't breathing. So you do need to be breathing and trying to initiate that, those breaths to be uh, stabilized on CPAP. But 76% of them were, were able to be successfully stabilized. But 50% of them under 750 grams failed. The other way to think of that is 50% of babies under 750 grams, which would be approximately the size of a 24 to 25 week baby, were fine on CPAP and were able to be maintained without a need for surfactant. They had likely over 5% of their normal surfactant pool size, either stimulated by the stress of being a growth restricted baby or from the antenatal steroids that we gave. When we look at even more babies out of the German data from a few years ago, this is a group of 225 babies that were an average gestational age of 26 weeks. 62% were stabilized with nasal CPAP and 51% failed. So similar numbers to what was seen in the Columbia data. But what they asked the question was, um, if we use 60% as our cutoff, which is what a lot of units use for FiO2, then 
what percent of the babies would hit 60% if they hit 40%? And what they found was that 84% of babies that hit a C, are on an adequate CPAP and hit a FiO2 of 40% um, will fail. So if we use 40% as a cutoff, only 16% of innovations could have been avoided if we use that. And the question being, is there injury that's occurring when those babies are between 40 and 60 percent? And many of us have moved to innovating babies that are between 30 and 40 percent uh, oxygen at, on adequate CPAP. These are the uh, compilation and uh, uh, meta-analysis, uh, now a lot, uh, almost eight years old, of the major trials of CPAP versus uh, surfactant in the delivery room. And what we find is when we take all these trials together, the biggest being the support trial, which was done by the Neonatal Network, and the COIN trial, which was done in, the, in Australia and New Zealand, we find that there's about a 17% reduction in BPD. What's also important to remember in these trials is that we, they analyzed them as intent to treat, meaning in the support trial, if you were in the delivery room, weren't breathing, and were get intubated and given surfactant, you'd actually be, uh, if assigned to the CPAP group, analyzed in the CPAP group. About 30% of babies had that. But even with this 17% reduction, which would support the use of CPAP early in these babies. But unfortunately, it doesn't work for all babies. I'm a huge advocate for using CPAP and, and uh, pushing for slightly higher levels of CPAP to try to recruit the lungs. But in many of these cases, the baby just doesn't have enough surfactant. And in those cases, we need to, need to give it to them. The biggest actual thing I utilize is oxygen. If a baby has enough surfactant, they typically can ma maintain themselves on a CPAP and a FiO2 of less than 30%. If they're higher than that and it's starting to climb, so above 40%, I often say that that baby is likely based on the German data, to be surfactant deficient and eventually need to be intubated. CO2 is climbing or apnea are also indications. Well, there's lots of data from, that shows that surfactant is good. These are all the major trials that were utilized to look at neonatal mortality. And for people that aren't used to using looking at these uh, diagrams, the easiest thing to do is to look at the bottom of the diagrams at the diamond. If the diamond is on one side or the other and not crossing the middle line, it favors one of the treatments or not. In this case, it favors mortality and BPD or death at 28 days. But of interesting note, it doesn't seem to change the rates of BPD. And that's because many more of these smaller babies are starting to survive. So we're able to keep uh, a good deal of these babies uh, alive. The other thing to remember about whenever thinking about the surfactant uh, trials early on is that the dates of the trials. As you can see over here on the sides, these are the dates of the publications of these trials. Um, they, uh, most of them are in the 1990s or the late 80s, um, and most of these trials were done before 1992. Why this is important is that in 1994, uh, it was recommended that we give antenatal steroids to uh, mothers at risk for preterm delivery. So it's hard to know what the numbers would actually be of these studies in the setting of widespread antenatal uh, use. Many of these babies were getting antenatal steroids because it was recommended or found by Liggins uh, back in 1972 that antenatal steroids help with lung maturation. And so many of these babies did have antenatal steroids, but it wasn't um, uh, recommended yet at that point and so it's an important caveat whenever thinking about early surfactant um, proteins. So it doesn't take a lot of surfactant to improve your lungs and decrease your risk of injury. So I showed you earlier LAM data on the amount of surfactant needed for CPAP, so about 4%. Well, what about the LAMs or the babies that we have to intubate? Because we do know that intubation in itself and giving big breaths or dangerous breaths can actually initiate an inflammatory response in the lungs. This is pro-inflammatory cytokine data. It's mRNA data from, from LAMs. But what you see is, is that IL-1 beta, IL-6, and IL-8 are all increased 
slightly with mechanical ventilation. But as you can see by the dotted line, which is about 8 milligrams per kilogram, or 8% of the normal pool size, we see a dramatic decrease. So it doesn't take a lot of surfactant in these lambs to decrease the injury that we're seeing. So what if we give surfactant without prolonged ventilation? Because the worry would be, would ventilation be the injurious uh, thing going on? What could we do to do that? Well, these are the methods that I'm going to talk about, but that give us the ability. Most of us are pretty common and uh, pretty comfortable with the idea of insure. So insure is the idea that if we intubate them, give them surfactant, and extubate them quickly, that we can decrease the amount of time that the the baby is on the mechanical ventilator. LMA administration of surfactant would avoid um, a prolonged ventilation period because you'd be applying it through a laryngo mask, and we'll talk about that, less invasive uh, therapy, and then nebulized therapy. So what about Insure? These are similar procedures, like uh, most of us do, to normal surfactant administration. But the goal is to actually have a brief, a rapid extubation from it. Most of the studies used innovated or mechanically ventilation as less than one hour as a mark for rapid extubation. Many of us nowadays innovate these babies, give them surfactant, and, and extubate them very quickly um, without giving them paralytics because this makes it, it harder to do. This is a some of the insure uh, data for the decrease for mechanical ventilation. Most of the studies that were used for testing insurer in both the developed and the developing world have used larger babies. They're greater than 30 um, weeks. And this was done because there was question about whether it would work very well in the smaller babies. Part of that is because some of these smaller babies are failing, not because that they're surfactant deficient, but because their chest wall is not very strong or that they can't um, maintain their airways without uh, appropriate PEEP levels. And, uh, but it does seem to show that you can decrease the need for mechanical ventilation, meaning if you pull it out, the majority of them then can, can do well on CPAP. That fits with the, our LAM data and with other data from early on when they first described respiratory distress syndrome uh, by Avery and all, they said that those babies had less than about 5% of the pool size. So when you give them uh, surfactant, remember you're trying, in some cases with Cervantia, you're giving 100 milligrams per kilogram, which is the amount that normally a term baby has at birth. And with CureSurf and some of the other ones, you're giving 200 milligrams per kilogram. And so they should have plenty of surfactant in there uh, via in, to be maintained on CPAP, assuming their chest wall or their respiratory drive is appropriate, which is why some small babies do not pat, do well on this. What about if I just need to get it down into the airway? The thing to remember about um, surfactant is that since it's a lipid, if we can get it into the trachea without even bagging it in, it should slowly spread along the airways. The airways will uh, slowly recruit up that surfactant and as they take deeper breath. So a laryngo mask airway would allow us to place it above the um, epiglottis and thus put the surfactant down into, into the airway where it will just naturally move its way down. With the laryngo mask airway, you do have the ability to give positive pressure breaths to kind of force it further into the distal lungs, uh, similar to the, an insure procedure. The only problem is that it's limited by the size of the LMA. And there are uh, hot companies working on making smaller LMAs, but as you can imagine, a, a size one LMA would probably fit in a term baby or bigger, um, but may not fit in our micropremies. The largest study so far of LMAs was done by Roberts et al. These were uh, preterm babies. They were 28 to 35 weeks. They had to be greater than 1,250 grams, and this was because of the availability of an LMA that will easily fit. But they could do it in babies that were 1,250 grams or, or, tall, or bigger. They uh, were supposed. To, they had to have a requirement of 30 to 40 percent for greater than 30 minutes. So they met that criteria of they weren't um, on CPAP and doing well, and they had to have RDS. 
And what they found was that they had decreased need for innovation. Um, they had uh, uh, less of an oxygen requirement because the LMA was able to get the surfactant into the airway and then it moved its way down into the more distal lungs. Even if some of it were to make it into um, the stomach, the majority of it makes it into the airway and, and, and does its role. So what about the idea of uh, minimally invasive surfactant therapy, MIST, or less invasive surfactant uh, administration, LISA? These are two names for the same thing. But the idea being that you're going to innovate a baby who's still on CPAP, who's still, or an IPVV, on non-invasive ventilation, and they're doing the work themselves, and instead of putting a giant breathing tube in, you're going to feed either a small catheter, they are making new catheters for this that are stiffer, um, in through their larynx in such a way that you get it in there while they're still breathing. And then you slowly, over a few minutes, in, in instill the surfactant directly into the trachea where it moves down. The benefit of this, or the theory behind this, is that it would improve the lung mechanics and lung injury by removing the, um, the injurious larger tidal volume ventilation that we often unfortunately give to these babies. These are two um, YouTube things that I won't have time to show you, but you can Google LISA or, or um, MIS therapy, and there are some very uh, nice training videos or, or demonstrated videos to get an idea of the procedure. But how does it work? Well, people have been studying this for lots of years now, and it's actually quite commonly used in um, European countries, especially in Germany. But these are the studies in the most recent uh, meta-analysis. It's a Cochrane review of LISA studies looking at BPD or death. And these are, as you can see, many of these are small studies, uh, the largest being um, 175 babies in, in each arm. But what you can see is that um, the little diamond at the bottom favors the use of LISA. So there's about uh, 0.58, so about a 42% uh, reduction in absolute reduction in the risk of BPD or death in the babies receiving LISA in these randomized trials. The need for innovation, of course, is smaller, it's, um, and that's because many of these babies get the surfactant and they can be maintained on the CPAP because they're still breathing on the CPAP during these events. And this favors LISA at, uh, at 0.63. So the largest trial to date, as I said, um, was the Optimist trial. And this uh, it was presented at PAS this year. And uh, with permission, I'm presenting the data. Um, these was uh, preterm babies, 25 to 29 weeks gestational age on CPAP with RDS. They had CPAP levels between five and eight centimeters of water and an FR2 of greater than 30%. They planned to enroll 606 babies. There were 303 were gonna be in each group. But unfortunately, due to recruitment, um, they ended the trial early um, at 81% of her full recruitment. They randomized 244 babies to MIST and 241 babies to the control group. Where that becomes important is, unfortunately, the study was slightly underpowered to show the effect they were looking for. But what we can look at the data, what we see is that the combination of death or BPD is um, not different. It's 0 0.08. But when we look at physiologic BPD, there is a difference of about 9% um, or 8% with a significant difference and that same adjusted risk ratio of 0.82. So similar to all the studies that we've just been showing. So when we were, to, if we're, one were to add this to that meta-analysis that we've shown, it would only strengthen the meta-analysis and show a benefit of um, LISA on BPD. But because of the study was stopped early for enrollment, um, we do not see the composite of death and BPD as different. The biggest use of LISA has been in um, many of the European countries. This is a German experience with LISA that was uh, published a few years ago now. So there's uh, much more babies being used 
in this cohort. But what they looked at is they looked at 2,624 babies that were given Lisa versus surfactant uh, things. And what they found was a variety of things. But the biggest thing is in this yellow box is they show a difference in BPD rate between um, Lisa at 21% versus surfactant at 37%, BPD or death at 24 versus 43, and death was also decreased. So this data also very much supports the use of LISA and goes along with the meta-analysis data with a very large uh, contemporary cohort. So what has happened in Germany because of this? Well, the actual use of surfactant has gone up, which is very interesting. It's because there are these marginal babies that likely would benefit from surfactant that we don't give surfactant to because we're worried that the mechanical ventilation itself will injure them and that the process of giving them surfactant by uh, putting them on a ventilator may outweigh in the marginal babies the benefits of surfactant. But what you can see is the use of LISA has gone way up over those years uh, as tube surfactant has gone down, but so is no surfactant. And so uh, what's being used more uh, frequently in many of the German places is the use of uh, LISA early on. It can even be done in the delivery room uh, in these um, really small babies, a 26, 27 weeker on CPAP, instead of intubating them, they may try LISA first. And then if they were to fail that due to um, chest wall strength or other things that contribute to failure, be it apnea, they would then receive mechanical ventilation. So what about nebulized surfactant? Nebulized surfactant isn't a new idea. It's been around for a long time. One of my research mentors, Michiko Ikigami, started working on this with her mentors uh, way back in the, in the 70s. And actually, it was because um, nebulized surfactant wasn't working exceptionally well that we may actually have how we give current surfactant. In that, the idea was if we instill it into the lungs versus we nebulize it, which is more, more efficient and more effective? And you may wonder why in the world do we do those four very strange uh, positions? And most of us have moved away from those four positions. But the reason we do those four positions for surfactant is that in the lamb, they actually have an extra bronchus up on the right upper lobe that's really hard to get surfactant into. So you place them in these four strange positions to get the surfactant into that lobe. Since it was shown in lambs to work, when they did the initial studies in humans, they went with the same procedure that was done in the lambs. Though humans do not have that extra bronchus in their right lung. And that's how we know now that probably just getting it into the airway is all that needs to be happen. My research mentor, Alan Job, then continued the work with, with Dr. Ikigami, um, and they showed that about 6% of the nebulized surfactant got into the lungs. So there was some getting in there, but it wasn't as effective as giving the surfactant directly into the lungs of the lambs. And thus, um, for a long time, it was a nebulized surfactant fell out of favor for a research standpoint. Part of it was that they were trying to get into the lower lungs. And many of the newer procedures actually make larger droplets that actually end up in the larger airways and then migrate their way down into the lower portions of the lungs. The largest of these trials was published now three years ago by Jane Pillows and the uh, Curanebs group. These were 29 to 31 week group uh, babies and also 32 to 34 weeks. They had two separate groups that were nebulized. And they nebulized um, surfactant. They used Curaserf, 200 milligrams per kilogram, and um, were able to repeat it. There were 32 in each group. And as you can see from the diagram, less babies in the nebulized surfactant group uh, failed than um, in the CPAP alone group. But when they found that looked at it more closely, what they found is that almost all the benefit was in the larger babies in the 32 to 34 week gestational age. When they, uh, a randomized trial uh, with the Arrow 2 sir, study investigators, published a year and a half ago now, um, they also showed a benefit overall in nebulized surfactant. But the benefit they saw was localized to these 33 to 34 week gestational age. 
this may be that these are the bigger babies that have the ability to pull the air in better than our micropremies. They don't have they have a surfactant deficiency, but they don't have the muscle wall or the strength uh, or the apnea issues that a micropremie might have. And so there is some benefit it appears in these larger babies. Of course, these larger babies are less likely to get injured by mechanical ventilation um, than our micro pre micropremies. When looking at um, this phase two trial by uh, uh, Benasud, what we find is that they find a difference at all the gestational ages. But the gestational ages in these are historical controls. So these aren't a ran this isn't a randomized trial, but she does still see a benefit in those larger babies. And then this is a, the biggest trial, um, a randomized trial so far. And I got this data from the European Clinical Trials Registry because this hasn't actually been uh, published. It's actually a trial that was stopped. It was sponsored by Chiesi. Um, what they did was they were randomizing them to a two-part study of spontaneous breathing. They did 129 babies that were randomized to nebulized Curacer for CPAP alone. These were 28 to 32-week babies. And the study was actually initially stopped in March of 2020 uh, when the pandemic hit. But while, during that time, they then did a, um, a safety monitoring board, and the monitoring board actually recommended to stop the study. And they recommended it based on the first 120 babies because they didn't see um, a benefit. They couldn't find that there was going to be a benefit even if they continued the, the study uh, further. And so the trial was stopped. But maybe this trial didn't work because it also included those 28 to 30-week babies that in the previous trials also didn't show a benefit. So I think there's still more to be told and to, to learn about uh, nebulized surfactant because it may work in bigger babies. It may work in those 30 to 32, 33 week babies. They're just working hard to breathe. that just need a little bit of surfactant um, and nebulized might be the way to go. One of the issues with nebulized surfactant is that you need more surfactant. And if, as all of us know, surfactant isn't the cheapest of medications. And so if we need more surfactant to get into the lung. But like I showed before, if you only need 5 to 10% of your surfactant pool size, a lot of it can go into your stomach and still have an effect. So I think nebulized surfactant is still um, investigational, but I think we've, they've made uh, a lot of great strides uh, with the new ways to, to aerosolize it to really create bigger particles. So the last part of my talk is going to be talking about instead of how you give surfactant, but can you add something to surfactant to affect its uh, lung injury? There are going to be babies that fail uh, CPAP, and there are going to be babies that need to be innovated given surfactant. So can we give them something along with the surfactant to decrease the lung inflammation? This is going to be um, off-label use, but it's also work that's been done by us at Cardinal Glennon uh, Children's Hospital with St. Louis University, but also with our colleagues in some of the LAM stuff with Cincinnati Children's and University of Western Australia. Myself and Alan Job have been working on this for a few years. We accomplished both human uh, from our studies in, in St. Louis and sheep from our studies in Perth and Western Australia. So what if we give a steroid to the lungs instead of systemic? The reason we worry about systemic steroids is that if we give every baby a systemic steroid, we showed that those babies have an increased risk of cerebral palsy. But what we do know is that the babies highest at risk of, for cerebral palsy or for bronchopulmonary dysplasia benefit from getting a systemic steroid. But what if I could limit it just to the lungs? So what is bedesonide? Bedesonide is a potent cortical steroid used in the treatment of asthma. It's pulmonary cord. Um, babies that um, go home and have RSV or have asthma are often on this medication, and kids uh, grow up on it and then utilize it either in nebulizers or in, in um, inhale. But it is potent. It's 10 times the affinity for the glucocorticoid receptor to dexamethasone, and that's 250 times that of cortisol. So you're giving a very potent steroid to the lung. It can be easily mixed, as I'll describe, with surfactant at the bedside and given the same way as surfactant alone. It does increase the volume by one ml uh, per kilogram. 
Um, and what happens is that surfactant transports the bidestinide to the more distal parts of the lung. The surfactant works as a carrier, both to help with the lung mechanics, but to also get the surfactant into the lung. So when bidestinide was used in inhaled form, um, it was shown to decrease the risk of BPD, as you can see here in the early work uh, by Baslin. But what was of concern was there seemed to be a non-significant increase in death in the bidestinide group. Now, these babies received bidestinide uh, multiple uh, inhalations every, um, every day for uh, multiple weeks. And so the dose of bidestinide in this, in this cohort was considerably higher than what is going, given directly into the lungs with surfactant. When they did the follow-up data at um, two years, the mortality became significant because a certain percent of babies had passed away after the 36-week evaluation. And so there was concern that could long-term bidestinide, though this was never seen in any other studies, and in meta-analysis, including this data, we do not see an increased mortality risk. What about giving it directly to the lungs? This is uh, Ye's data that was uh, published in um, 2015 online and officially in 2016 for people looking for it. What they did was they randomized babies that had um, an FIO2 greater than 50% and were on pretty high support in their NICUs to either receive um, bides, uh, surfactant, this is um, Cervanta, with 0.25 milligrams per kilogram of bidestinide. So for many people that use Pomacort, that would be one ml per kilogram of bidestinide versus surfactant alone. And what they showed was that they could decrease their rate of BPD or death from 66% in the surfactant only group to 42% in the surfactant plus bidestinide group and they changed the severity of, of BPD uh, as well in these babies. The concern was that these were mainly babies from Taiwan, though there were some babies that came out of Cook uh, County in Chicago, and whether this was really um, translatable to other babies around the world. The decrease in BPD was very significant, and it, um, but it was shown to be quite, quite safe. They had done a previous study before this in 2008, which was their pilot study. And when you put the two together, uh, these two randomized trials, what you can see is the diamond's even more in favor of it. So the, the risk of D BPD decreases significantly by about 40%, which is what was seen in the other study, 66 to 42. Um, and the risk of death or BPD uh, decreases by about 40%. We then tried to do it in our lambs to say at a molecular level, was the bidestinide doing anything? So these are lambs that were intentionally um, ventilated. And uh, what you can see, this is mRNA data. Or markers of um, inflammation. And what we find is that at two hours of life, that surfactant and bidestinide decreases the uh, markers of inflammation for IL-1 beta, IL-6, MCP-1. That same protection is continued with the same one dose all the way out to um, six hours, and then by 24 hours, there isn't much difference. The sodium channel in our lungs that pumps that water out is also increased by it. So there is a direct steroid effect, which is what we might expect with giving them a steroid. In the YAY studies, they showed IL-8 was decreased as late as eight days after they gave the, the doses of bidestinide. I'd like to say that bidestinide stays in the lungs. And it's questionable in humans whether it does or not. In lambs, it doesn't. It um, is found in the plasma within 15 minutes of, of um, giving it. And when we look over here on the, the B section, what we find is that of the dose of it, uh, bidestinide gets hydrolyzed, which means it's changed into a form that stays in your lung a little bit longer. But what we find is that if we look at um, the amount of bidestinide in your lungs at two hours in these lambs, only about 
7% of the dose is still there. And by 24 hours, um, the majority of the dose is gone. Less than 2% is in the lung. Which would tell us that, that bedesonide has a direct effect on the lungs and the inflammation, but should we be watching really closely for effects on the um, uh, systemic effects. This is data from humans. These are 60-year-old babies that they were testing bedesonide and surfactant in older babies at three different doses. But all you need to remember from this is that there, it is detectable in the plasma of even older babies, um, preterm babies. Does it have an effect on the rest of your body? It does seem to affect your brain and your liver. So in your liver, these are the same pro-inflammatory cytokines, but as you can see, there's a decreased amount of them in the liver and in the brain. So this is having a systemic effect. Uh, we believe a positive systemic effect, um, but we do need to know that it is affecting the body and not just the lungs of these lambs and likely not just the lungs of the babies. So we've published two, two observational studies of um, bedesonide, and these are the two uh, studies, one in pediatric research in 2020 and one in uh, journal of perinatology in 2021. I'm gonna go through some of the data of this, but I'm gonna actually show you, this is, these two papers are on the first 174 babies that we gave it to compared to 300 babies before. So historical cohorts, so you have to remember that anytime you have a co cohorts, that other things could change, though not many things changed during that time. Um, but I, we've continued to use it, and I'm going to present in some early data on um, 300 babies that have received it, 314. So our cohort design was that in August 1st, 2016, we decided that date based on the YAY studies and based on other to switch every baby. All the babies that failed are invasive and are really aggressive use of bubble CPAP to um, try to prevent um, innovations, if they were innovated, they got surfactant, but we also added bedesonide to it. And we added 0.25 milligrams per kilogram. And this intervention was done in the delivery room. It was done by in the NICU if it was the first time they were getting surfactant. And we even did it with our transport team on, on outborn babies that were coming in that were micro preemies. We um, compared these to a series of babies between that were beforehand and we've continued to do this so that we have two cohorts. One I'll present that's 174 babies that have received it, and the next cohort includes those 174, but is now at 314. We extracted a lot of the data using EPIC uh, so we could look at very granular data on um, how they were doing over time. These babies had to be over 23 weeks gestational age. We have given it to 22 weekers. Um, but we did not study it in, the, in this data I'm going to show you. And they had to be greater than 500 grams, that we have given it to babies under 500 grams. So these are the large two cohorts. As you can see, the average gestational age of our babies that fail CPAP is 26.8 weeks, with no difference between the two, and about 870 to 850 grams. Um, the most, there's a similar number of males or Caucasians, a similar number get antenatal steroids, you might think the antenatal steroid number is low in the 80% range, and that's because these are the babies that fail CPAP. The majority of our babies that receive antenatal steroids, we can maintain on CPAP um, and never need to be intubated. We look at the placentas of almost all our babies. It's about 90% of our babies get placental uh, pathology, and um, there's no difference in choreo. Their APGARs were the same. Their CRIB2 scores were the same, and they both received about two doses of surfactant. What about early on? So this is the first three uh, dashes are actually at six hours, 12 hours, and 24 hours. And then afterwards, it's, it's daily data. What you can see when we look at respiration, that the babies they'll breathe a little bit faster with bedesonide, um, but it's only two breaths per minute. So uh, when you have very, you, what's to remember about large data sets is that if you have um, 300 babies in each arm, even two, Two points make a difference, whether that's clinically important or not. Um, their oxygen requirement was lower, and their FIR2 to saturation, to make sure that we were keeping saturations the same, were uh, was higher in the bedesonide. 
group. What's most striking is the number of babies that are innovated. So by 12 hours of life, we start seeing an improvement in their lung function, enough that we start seeing an increase in intubate, a decrease in number of babies intubated. When we then follow this out over the first 11 days, there's a difference in the number of babies intubated. As I'll show in the next slide, we use a very systematic use of uh, postnatal dexamethasone in babies that qualify, and we utilize that between seven and 10 days. And that's why you see that dramatic decrease in intubation by about 10 days, because many of these babies in that group are receiving um, postnatal dexamethasone. When we look at heart rate, there's some small differences, but the biggest difference of interest is this mean arterial pressure. So the babies with bedesonide, even as early as uh, 12 hours of life, have an increase in mean arterial pressure. Uh, when we divide it by gestational age, that's still maintained. Since I talked about cohorts, you have to remember other things could change. And the one thing that has changed over time is our use of delayed cord clamping. So in babies that have delayed cord clamping, uh, they have a higher overall mean hemoglobin. The thing about that is when we then correct for the mean hemoglobin for their gestational age, antenatal steroids, gender, um, race, we still see an improvement in, in mean arterial pressure. And this was seen in Ye's studies and in one other smaller study. When we look at the use, because they have better um, blood pressures, we find that uh, there's about half as many babies in the cohort that need um, dopamine and the same amount with dobutamine. We use a lot less dobutamine in these babies uh, overall and hydrocortisone. So we had the question about, well, maybe we're creating um, adrenal insufficiency and that's something we need to watch closely for. What we find is that the same percent of babies need um, hydrocortisone, but there seems to be a slight delay in it that babies that are on the bedesonide with with surfactant actually need um, hydrocortisone uh, at a later time at uh, about five days versus a mean day of about two and a half days on the um, surfactant cohort. But the number of doses was about, about the same. When we look at the reasoning for it, there's a difference. There's more hypotension in the um, surfactant group than there is in the surfactant plus budesonide group. And that, of course, happens earlier with that mean airway, with that mean arterial pressure. So many of them get hydrocortisone then versus the babies that have surfactant but budesonide are more likely to present with a hyperkalemia, though the mean is only slightly higher. There is a higher percent of babies with greater than 5.5. These are definitions from uh, nephrology. Um, there is no difference in, in hyponatremia, their urine outputs are very similar, and the percent that have oligo um, is only slightly higher, they're not statistically. And when we look at the number of symptoms, they're very similar. So it does appear that they have a similar amount of adrenal insufficiency to babies without it, though the timing might be different. What about their lungs? So we use the uh, NICHD BPD calculator as a way to measure how much there are bad, that poor their lungs are. What we find is that um, at, at seven days, that 41% of our babies have greater than a 60% risk of severe BPD on the calculator, which is statistically less than um, the babies in the traditional cohort. I'll move my picture so you can see it. Um, the postnatal dexamethasone use, because we follow this as a guideline, also uh, changes. By 36 weeks, less of these babies are intubated and are on NIPPV. Similar amounts are on, are on uh, uh, CPAP. And what this does is it changes the grading of the BPD. So although the absolute amount of BPD is very similar between the two groups, the overall um, severity of the BPD is less uh, with our um, surfactant plus bidesonide. These are neonatal cords from the initial 170, but what you can see is there's very similar rates of perforation, neck, blood cultures, IVH, PVL, ROP. There is a significant difference in PDA on echo and PDAs requiring medical treatment and or ligation. This is seen in a lot of steroid literature. So this is very consistent with the steroid literature that um, steroids decrease PDA, but we didn't see any difference in pulmonary hemorrhage and PIE need for sildenafil as a marker for pulmonary hypertension or insulin for hypoglycemia. When they discharge, they, they now discharge about 
um, on average, remember these have the same gestational age at birth, about nine days earlier. Um, their mean gestational age at discharge is about a week earlier, which is consistent with that. The death rate is about the same at 11% in both groups. IVH and is the same, and nasal cannula is, is the same. So overall, they're um, leaving the hospital about a week earlier than before. What about their uh, neurodevelopmental outcome? What we find is that in the, um, when we did Peabody scales by our physical therapists at six months of life, we find that there's no uh, difference between the two groups with regard to uh, fine or gross motor skills when evaluated. There, uh, when you ask the mothers or the evaluations or the family about the physical therapists about concerns about motor concerns, they're about the same between the two. And then when looking through all the notes, they have similar uh, muscle tone noted in both groups uh, at six months. The Peabody, uh, I mean, the Bailey three exams were done on these babies. It has to be, as you can see, the big asterisk is that COVID came. And because of that, our percent of babies, um, though not statistically less, we were able to do less Bailey scores on them. Um, overall, they were similar uh, between the groups, uh, but the ones were slightly younger in the, in the Bailey group, in the surfactant plus pedestinine group. But what you can see is that there is no difference in the Bailey scores. There's no difference in the number of, of infants that have less than 70 or less than 85 on one or more domains. And when you want to combine Bailey score of less than 80 as a way to compare it to the Bailey 2 scores, um, and there was no difference there either. So where do we go from here? Well, Ye et al. The, that did the initial studies in Taiwan are completing another trial, but this time they're using CuraSurf instead of Cervanta. And by uh, personal communications, um, they're nearly done recruiting on this study. There are two major trials that are over, undergoing around the world. They're randomizing babies to either bedestinide 0.25 milligrams per kilogram with surfactant, which is what we do, um, or Cervanta, or surfactant. They're using CuraSurf in these studies, though we use Cervanta in ours. The PLUS trial, which is in Australia and New Zealand and other parts of the world, has been enrolling babies. They're about halfway done with enrollment. They reached 618 babies at about 19 sites. Their goal is 1,066, and they passed their first DSMB for review, showing that it, it was safe, though efficacy is still underway. The Bedestinite in Babies trial, the BIB trial, is being run by the U.S. Uh, NENAL network. They've enrolled, when I last asked, 52 babies with a plan to do 11,066. So we do have a little bit of time before these two major trials are released um, to give us a little bit more definitive large-scale um, trials. So in summary, the glottis sometimes abnormally closes in preterm babies. And in these cases, ventilation is impossible. But early use of, of CPAP stabilizes this glottis and should be used early in the delivery room, very quickly to try to keep them from going into this apneic space. Uh, state. Surfactant therapy can be, decrease lung injury from mechanical ventilation, but avoidance of mechanical ventilation must be maybe the most important part. And that's why non-invasive mechanical ventilation, uh, non-invasive um, surfactant may be a way to decrease this. Insure techniques are using an LMA or another device like that decreases the mechanical ventilation time and should decrease injury, though this was not uh, studied in most of these bigger babies because it's hard to study BPD in larger babies. LISA technique provides surfactant to the lungs and decreases the risk of BPD. It doesn't it does require some training, though in truth, the new catheters that are coming out will be out um, in the future, make it much easier to innovate uh, because you don't need to use a McGill uh, forcep. They're stiffer. Nebulized surfactant is still experimental, but it does show some promise in the larger preterm babies, and so that may be the niche where it would work the best. And the addition of bedestinine to surfactant is easy to administer. It can be done right at the bedside. How we do is we pull up the surfactant in one um, syringe. We pull up the bedestinide in another syringe. We have a small plastic connector. We shoot the um, bedestinide into the surfactant. We gently mix it, and then we give it just like we would surfactant. So it takes about a minute, and bedestinide costs about a dollar. So there are currently large trials underway, and we've given it to about 314 babies. So thank you very much.
for your attention. I'm here live now to answer any questions you may have.